Okay, hi. I have been working for the last two years here at UC Santa Cruz as an IMPS postdoc, don't ask me what it stands for, uh, with Xavier Prochaska, the astronomer formerly known as Jason. Uh, also, Jason Tomlinson and Chris Tom and the COS Halos team, uh, and uh, they're all pictured here. I have been working to characterize what's known as the circumgalactic medium. So, the circumgalactic medium is loosely defined as the gas that surrounds galaxies within their own halos out to about 100 to 300 kiloparsecs. Although the structure, uh, the physical properties of the circumgalactic medium and its relation to galaxies is still highly uncertain and widely debated, I think the circumgalactic medium is the new frontier. If you're interested in accretion, if you're interested in outflows, this is the medium through which all of that material must pass. It lies at the nexus of accretion and outflows. It may reflect the theoretically predicted transition between the cold flows of accreting gas onto spiral, actively star-forming galaxies and the quasi-static hot envelopes that are thought to surround passively evolving galaxies. So, for the purposes of this talk, I think I would like to define the circumgalactic medium as diffuse gas, including metals and dust, often extending to 300 kiloparsecs and largely bound to the galaxy's dark matter halo. Of course, one problem in studying the circumgalactic medium is that it's too diffuse to be studied directly in a mission, and a single sight line, say, to a quasar, on average intersects less than one massive galaxy halo. So you have to design a carefully uh, constructed uh, experiment in order to study the circumgalactic medium. There are basically two approaches. Uh, method A, you look at a, an absorption line spectrum, say to a quasar, you find absorption lines, Lyman series, go hunting for a galaxy post facto, uh, at that redshift and then characterize its circumgalactic medium. Perhaps if you don't want to bias yourself to systems that already exhibit absorption, what you would do is you would look for foreground galaxy quasar pairs and you would know the redshift of that galaxy and then go looking in the spectrum of the quasar for absorption at that particular redshift. And so that is what we've done with the COS HALOS project. It's what we're calling COS HALOS. It, as the name might suggest to you, it's done using the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph on HST, which is a spectrograph that's optimized for the ultraviolet. Uh, its effective area is 10 to 20 times that of STIS with a higher sensitivity. And so what we've done is we've selected quasar galaxy pairs from uh, SDSS and GALAX. And, uh, and we're trying to statistically map the circumgalactic medium. And so COS HALOS as a, a survey is sort of the first of its kind. It represents a uniform, a very uniform data set of a multi-phase suite of ions uh, from a homogeneous sample of 51 galaxies that are specifically selected to have properties such as L star, masses between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 solar masses, uh, were specifically selected to lie on impact parameters less than 150 kiloparsecs to really probe the circumgalactic material around galaxies. Um, and of course, this is done rather than blindly observing a set of bright quasars and then obtaining galaxy redshifts post facto. So here's a, here's a statistical map. Uh, here's a, a map uh, that I've done very in a sophisticated way with PowerPoint. Uh, we have both uh, blue uh, star-forming galaxies and red elliptical galaxies. And you can see here, so you, you can picture it schematically, like the quasars in the center there and our sight lines probe from a range of, you know, 50 kiloparsecs out to 150 kiloparsecs, very close in to somewhat further out. And, uh, if you don't believe me that the circumgalactic medium exists, um, here I, I, I've just selected uh, four examples to show you where that kind of reflect the design of this survey. And so you see on, uh, on the top left there a snapshot from SDSS where you've got the quasar, you've got that little smudge looking galaxy uh, at redshift of 0.2. The, the redshifts of cost halos are selected to be between 0.1 and 0.2, the, the galaxies so as to highlight oxygen-6, which is a very sexy transition. 
Uh, and so, uh, so you see here the impact parameter, the redshift. What we do is we then go to Keck and we really pin down the redshift of this galaxy uh, to within 10 to 15 kilometers per second. And then we go looking in our cost spectrum of the quasar and bam, you see Lyman alpha absorption right at the um, velocity of the galaxy. And so I can, I could do this all day, uh, just showing you these snapshots, our Keck spectrum from which we derive very accurate redshifts, and then you go looking in the spectrum and bam, there's Lyman alpha. Okay, you can do it again and again. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting things to come out of this is work being led up by Chris Tom. And, uh, oh, well, that should say the H1 gas, not the H1 ga, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that you can see that uh, the circumgalactic medium is ubiquitous around galaxies, but not only is it ubiquitous around galaxies, it's around both early type galaxies and late type galaxies. And so this, this photoionized 10 to the 4K, which is somewhat cool medium, is surrounding early type galaxies and late type galaxies with a high covering fraction, uh, column densities greater than 10 to the 15, around nearly every L star galaxy, regardless of its st current star formation rate. So uh, my second point is meant to be somewhat provocative, but uh, you know you can you can say well there's a lot of cold gas around elliptical galaxies. So as far as I can tell, there's no obvious suppression of cold accretion around massive ellipticals. Okay, so what happens when you look at the lower ionization states of heavy metal lines? Uh, you see that the covering fractions are a little bit lower; they're around half. Um, and there's really no obvious distinction between blue and our red galaxy sight lines. You see on, this, uh, oh, on these plots, in case you're not familiar with them, you've got rho, which is impact parameter distance from the galaxy. So this is the distance into the cir circumgalactic medium that you're probing. And then on the y-axis, there's, in this case, equivalent width. Uh, you can put column density up there if you can convert your equivalent width to a column density, which you can do fairly easily. Um, so you can see that the, the lower ionization states, you know, they, they're there, not with as much uh, frequency as the H1, but you can tell that they, they kind of trace the higher column density uh, gas. And so there are a lot of intermediate ionization state metals. It turns out that silicon-3 and carbon-3 are really good tracers of the circumgalactic medium. I think this is, this is better than anyone would have predicted. Um, there just turns out there's a lot of silicon-3 and carbon-3, and maybe this is reflective of some characteristic temperature of the circumgalactic medium, but you can see here uh, column density of silicon-3 versus impact parameter. You've got about a 70% covering fraction out to 150 kiloparsecs. Again, you see no obvious distinction between the blue and the red galaxies. Um, there's this decreasing trend with impact parameter, and the gas gets uh, a little less dense. Maybe this is a reflection of the ionization state of the gas as you go out from a galaxy. Galaxy. And of course, the higher ionization state metals will really are our highest pro, our, our biggest probe of this uh, more highly ionized gas, more like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Kelvin gas is oxygen 6. Uh, Jason Tomlinson has spoken extensively about this. Uh, and in oxygen 6, it's kind of a weird puzzle because, like I was saying, H1 ubiquitous around galaxies. The lower ionization states, the intermediate ionization states, we see no obvious distinction between blue and red galaxies. But then when you look at the oxygen 6, which is thought to trace the circumgalactic medium the best, you see that there's a very few detections around the redder galaxies, and it's nearly ubiquitous around star-forming galaxies. This is actually statistically significant, and even weirder than that, what Jason Tomlinson has spoken about, is that the strength of the oxygen-6 absorption tends to correlate with the current star formation rate of the galaxy, which is extremely weird considering the distances and time scales involved, and it's not thought to be a causal relationship, but it's kind of a, a weird and very statistically significant correlation. So. What's the origin of this gas? Is it accreting IgM gas? Are we seeing uh, cooling coronal gas? Are these cold flows? Are these extended H1 disks? Uh, tidal debris? Well, I think the answer is clearly all of the above. Uh, I'm not here to make distinctions. Pick one, I think, uh, I think you'll be correct. So something that I've been really interested in lately is measuring the baryonic content of the circumgalactic medium, redshift zero, L-star galaxies. Because 
It's often said that galaxies are missing their baryons. Galaxies are highly baryon depleted relative to the cosmological fraction. And so, you know, Big Bang nucleosynthesis is one of, you know, the most resounding successes of modern astrophysics. Uh, you, it's you know, the, the cosmological fraction of baryons is very well known, and yet when you look at an L-star galaxy, you count up all the mass in stars, in the ISM, and then you look at the hot corona with x-rays, and you look at HVCs, neutral gas around galaxies, you're missing about 80% of your baryons relative to the cosmological fraction. So, it's been said, mostly by X-ray astronomers like Joel Bregman, that galaxies are missing a huge number of their baryons. Maybe they didn't fall in in the first place. Um, anyway, I, uh, I think that this work that we're doing with cos halos, and in particular looking at the lower ionization states and the higher ionization states of these heavy metal lines, that we're actually seeing these quote-unquote missing baryons. And I would even go even further to assert that galaxies are not baryon depleted relative to the cosmological fraction. So I, I've done some calculations, uh, and oh, I think I have a little bit of time to go through them. So Jason Tumlinson in his paper nicely defined a lower limit to the amount of gas in this more highly ionized phase, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 Kelvin. And so it's a very simple calculation, pi r squared. There's a nice formula everyone can get behind. Uh, and, uh, and then you multiply by the column density of O6 times, you know, 16 times the mass of a hydrogen atom. And then you uh, apply an ionization uh, correction for oxygen 6, which turns out it's totally maximized at about 20%. Um, this just comes out of phono photo ionization and collisional ionization modeling. Uh, and so you can quickly calculate that the lower limit to the amount of gas in this highly ionized phase is at least 2 by 10 to the 9. This is if you assume that it's solar metallicity, which is, you know, if you assume it's 10th solar, then you all of a sudden got 2 times 10 to the 10 solar masses of gas in this highly ionized phase. I'm sorry? That's what? Two. It's still too little, that's right. But I still have more to count. And that's a lower limit. Keep in mind, lower limit. That can really only go up. Okay, so then when you look at, say, this, is, this comes right out of the mass metallicity relation for galaxies, that's the purple line, uh, and, uh, and so you can see that you've got this mass of oxygen and, uh, and then stellar mass on the x-axis, and there's almost as much oxygen in this highly ionized phase of the circumgalactic medium as in the interstellar medium. Okay. But now, what about these, uh, oh yes, right, I wanted to say something about Xi Jing Shen's work. Uh, she's simulating this and is able to reproduce the oxygen-6 absorption that we see in cos halos. She's going to tell you about this tomorrow. I think it's very exciting work. So, okay, now I've counted up, I've, I've added in to my pie chart, because astronomers love pie charts, the warm CGM, like you said, not enough, still not enough. It's only another 14%. We're still missing 63%. Now, that's based on the lower limit there. Again, that can really only go up. So now I can put a lower limit on the cooler ions in the same way that Jason Tumlinson put a lower limit on his higher ionization state oxygen. So it turns out it's actually comparable to oxygen, about 10 to the 9. Uh, that's, again, if you assume Z solar. But actually, I can do a lot better than this because I have a whole range of lower ionization state lines. I can do cloudy modeling, photoionization modeling. I can add in photoionizing radiation from the galaxy. I can change my spectrum. It turns out that the results really aren't sensitive to what I use in the photoionization modeling. If you want to talk to me more about this, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, and uh, so we get a range of metallicities. We derive ionization parameters very carefully from this cloudy modeling for the sight lines where we have good enough data in order to do so. And then we can get an actual mass of the circumgalactic medium in this cooler phase, this photoionized phase, and lo and behold, we get somewhere between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 solar masses of gas in this cooler photoionized phase of the circumgalactic medium. So again, now I'm just, I'm, I'm at the very least, this pie chart represents everything we see. So there's still missing potentially 35%, but actually, I mean, given the limitations of these studies and the uncertainties, I think there's really no reason that people should continue to go around asserting that galaxies are baryon depleted. And so, uh, 
That's really all. The next steps are to look at dwarf galaxies, to go out to higher redshift, high, more, higher impact parameter, get our, pin down our H1 measurements. We have to deal with saturation effects. It's ugly. Um, but anyway, that's about all I wanted to say. Thanks. <coughs>